Right. Good morning. Still morning, isn't it? Yeah, I'm Graham Fulton. What else? And this is Elizabeth Bay House. It will come back to us during the story. An interesting place on Sydney Harbour. Um, just just behind here, over behind, say, that house there, you'll find the Opera House and Circular Quay now. So it's a very central position. It doesn't look anything like that anymore. Now I'm going to talk about an early European Australian family, the Maclays, and their dynasty. Their dynasty is entwined in the foundation of Australian biological history. And yet most people who have never heard of it don't know it. And it amazes me. For instance, unbeknownst to most of you in the room, Professor Ernest Goddard got his start in biology from the Maclays. He got a fellowship. It's not lost on me that right now I'm standing in the Goddard building. The Maclay Reach is everywhere. I also benefited from a um, fellowship from the Maclays in, in the mid 90s. Uh, I, I became the Maclay, McClure Maclay Centenary Research Fellow, which is a research fellow fellowship jointly funded by the University of Sydney, the Maclay Museum, and the Russian government. The Russian government got involved because of Nikolai McClure Maclay, who was, or is, in, in their eyes, a legend. He's taught to Russian students in primary school. He's an ethologist who went to New Guinea in the 1860s and refused to carry a gun or any form of violent protection. And put himself on the beach, told the Navy ship that dropped him there to go away and come back in a few months. He mixed with the people there and learnt a lot. So in Russia, he's very famous for taking this attitude. So when I became a research fellow at the McLean Museum, I was interested in the birds, of course. 10,000 birds. Um, and brilliant. It is an amazing collection. The only skeleton in the world of a paradise parrot. There was a dodo, which I sexed recently. It turns out to be a girl. Not full dodos. There's only two full dodo skeletons in the world. Hueyers. Does anyone know what Hueyers are? Extinct New Zealand bird. Wonderful bird. Very rare. I understand a feather sold about 60 years ago for, for $20,000 a single feather. These birds are rare. Oh, they're extinct. McLean Museum has 20 or 30 of them. Kakapos, which are coming back in New Zealand. At the time I worked there, they weren't. They looked like they were going to, going to extinction. McLean Museum holds 20% of the world's kakapos in museums. Um, night parrot, of course. A night parrot that hadn't seen daylight for a hundred years, unlike the ones in other museums, hadn't faded. Brilliant. But the McLean Museum was much, much more than 10,000 birds. They had collections of mammals, marine collections, fantastic collections of fish, and the best collection in the world of insects. They are so famous for this. 10,000 type specimens. 100,000 specimens altogether. Incredibly impressive. But beyond all that, they have a history. And it's the history that really enthralled me too much so, because I haven't been paid to be that fellow for a long time, but I keep publishing on it. I can't let it go. I published Sixteen publications, but seventeen now. I just sent another one away, which include mostly refereed papers, and book reviews. There's a book chapter, hundred, hundred page book chapter, and last last year I finished a hundred thousand word book on the Shepherd expedition. So it's a fascinating history and difficult to let go. Mm. Today I can't talk about the whole thing; it's too much. So I focused on. The main protagonists in the story, Alexander Maclay, William Sharp Maclay, 
William John McLean and the McLean Museum. So my talk will be about those people oh, and the museum. But let's get started with my button. Today's talk is entitled Adjectival Betrayal, the history of the McClays, the McLean Museum and the Shepherd Expedition. Well, I won't really talk about the Shepherd Expedition today, there's not enough time. And I write in blood for a reason. I write adjectival for a reason. I'm not happy. I'm not allowed to write the adjective that I want to write there that starts with F. As my five-year-old daughter tells me I'm not allowed to swear. So it's adjectival betrayal. And at the end you'll learn more about that. Okay getting started. It's 1893. Someone, I don't know who, no one knows who, took this photo. This is the McLean Museum in the grounds of the University of Sydney. The photo was taken from the back of the Great Hall. It was two years old when the photo was taken. So we're move, moving through time a little bit. Okay, going back further in time now, 1767, an entirely different place. We're now at the north of Scotland. Um, you have to use your imagination a little. If you look at the top of the horizon there, there's some modern buildings that weren't there in 1767. So try and ignore those. Look at the foreground here. These are buildings built by the Romans about, uh, about a thousand years earlier. No, more than that. Oh, about a thousand years old. These are loosely called roundhouses and they would live inside because it's too cold outside. This is very north of Scotland. You go any further north and you're going to fall into the ocean. Katniss. This is where Alexander Maclay grew up. Well, he was born in this year. Interestingly, about the same time as Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, and in the early part of the place where Bonaparte comes in a little bit because of the wars. So Alexander would get around this sort of field collecting insects as a, as a child and the story starts. Now occasionally I'll put an anchor up to sort of anchor you in time. When I think about history I think about dates being involved because I like context. A lot of historians tell me dates are unimportant me they're important. So in 1770 Cook landed at Botany Bay. A few years, no, three years old I think Alexander was him. So at this time the world was interested in what was happening in other places. Alexander grew up in this time. He was thinking about what the rest of the world looked like, what was to be found there. Here he is, Alexander McLean. His father of Australian history, father of Australian zoology, it says there, and um, that will develop as we go along. You might believe it. He was not poor. His father was the provost of Wick, which is the county, or the town, it's inside Catness where he grew up. He also became a wine merchant, made a lot of money out of that. He uh, was a part owner of a bank a bit later. Again, made money out of that. Alexander McClay was used to having money. He was a gentleman collector. And at this time, museums, big museums, are only just beginning. His cabinet, which was a museum, not a single cabinet. When I say cabinet, don't get the wrong idea. It's, it's, it's a very extensive museum, his cabinet. Would be regarded very soon as the best in the world. He had the money to buy. Okay. 1788, First Fleet lands in Botany Bay. No, Botany Bay, Sydney Harbour, sorry. Um, important to European history. But also the founding of the Linnaean Society of London, which in the long run I think is far more important, particularly to us. The Linnaean Society of London is a definite foundation in science. Alexander was part of that. Of course he was. He was highly regarded and invited. He became an elected fellow to London, London, I'm sorry, London in 1794. 
again, buying, swapping, accumulating. By now, his name is appearing in all the papers of the day. Thank you, Alexander McClay, for letting me look at your collection. Didn't publish as a scientist himself, but he's mentioned constantly. Also in auction notices, his name keeps coming up. He's there, buying astutely. Secretary of the Linnaean mm -hmm. Society, at the same time he worked for the War Office. 1798, now we're moving on. The war with Napoleon was, was raging and there were prisoners to swap. Gentlemen prisoners. So, often scientists. And McClay fancied swapping scientists more than other people. So, that was very useful if you happen to be a scientist of the day. So, the French ones would go back to the English in court and the French would send back the English ones. He became Fellow of the Royal Society, 1809, member of Academy of Sciences of Stockholm, then Turin. And then, surprisingly, with the best cabinet in the world, the best private museum in the world, he was told, we no longer need you at the War Office, and he needed the money. The Bank of Scotland was struggling. And they offered him a job in Australia, the other side of the world. He was nearly 60 years old. He didn't want to go did was he needed the money. One of the things he brought with him to Australia was six daughters. Now that might seem a bit mercenary to target but it was very important in the day because at that time there wasn't a Brisbane, not that I know of, and Sydney streets were paved with mud especially when it rained. So to have six educated upper-class daughters arriving in this outpost of Sydney it was big news, it's what the newspapers were full of. But he did something else. He brought the finest museum in the world to Australia. This was unexpected. Totally unexpected. And suddenly we had the best museum. And yet this is the CBD of Sydney when he brought the best museum in the world to Australia. Um, I get chills just thinking about that. This place had the best museum in the world. It's our foundation. Wonderful. So a bit more about Alexander arriving in Australia. He became the colonial secretary. The colonial secretary is the second person in charge head is the governor. Number two is the colonial secretary. The governor is appointed and, and changed when politicians in London think it should be happening. So the person making all the decisions is really this man, Alexander McClay. He made some good decisions and we thank him for the Australian Museum, the first library in Sydney went on to become the State Library, the Botanical Gardens, and some other things there. He also became the first Speaker of the Legislative Assembly. He was a giant of that time, and a giant to biology. And he had a museum, and people, the scientists in Australia at the time, would come here to his museum. And he also did that, coming back to that picture. He built this house. Alexander liked to live in style. He had the money. He loved it. So this glorious house, Elizabeth Bay House, was built on Elizabeth Bay appropriately, hence the name. That painting was painted in 1850. Okay, here's inside the house today. Today the house is a museum. This is what we might see if we go there. On the left is the entranceway. Um, you see the dome at the top? Let me go back one. See the dome at the top there over the entrance? And from the inside, it looks like that on the left. So, I have an apartment with an entrance, but nothing like that. In fact, as you come through the door, front door, this is what you see. What I have in my apartment in Brisbane is a front door. Not like that though. 
is a, a sitting room, drawing room, I don't know what they call it, on the right. But that's where they lived then. Uh, notice the bust on the right. Again, that will come back to us. Some other Maclays. And that other Maclays. Fanny. Who breaks my heart. A little bit sad story there, Fanny. She was a very happy girl. And she was very good at drawing. This is one of her drawings here. I love the detail, particularly note the snail down on the bottom right. I also love the blue in this. Fantastic. She drew for Robert Brown. Do, do we know Robert Brown? Good as a couple of notes, not many. Um, Robert Brown is the foundation of, of botany in Australia. So she was probably drawing Australian specimens in London before she ever came here. And, and she had a big love affair with Robert Brown. But her mother didn't like it. Her mother was against it because Robert Brown was 20 years older than her. Uh, her dad was probably in the Greens, Alexander, but not the mum. Later on, her mum would write that she would live to regret that decision because Fanny, uh, and we have lots of knowledge about Fanny from all the letters she wrote to her elder brother. These are rediscovered in the late 90s and published. Fantastic stuff. Give us a, 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 an insight from a female point of view, which is often lacking in history. So, wonderful stuff. But she said she would never marry. And eventually she did. She did not mention of this man she married in the letters before, said suddenly she got married. Oh, but alas, six weeks later she was dead. Yeah, heartbreaking story. And from the letters, you read through one book, you get to love her, and the ending is horrible. But she was undoubtedly involved with lots of scientists that came from Alexander's door in London and in Australia. And we need to dig harder to find her pictures. This is George, Sir George Maclay. George is, I guess, mostly famous for being a politician. The Maclays were heavily involved in politics because that's where the money was. And, and, and they were upper class, and that's what happened in those days. What he's forgotten for is the work he did as an explorer. He explored with Charles Sturt. They took a boat down the Murrumbidgee, down the Darling River, onto the Murray River, and down to the Coorong. It's a very famous story. It's been given a lot of press lately because of the lake lakes drying out down in South Australia. And they talk about it because of that. What they don't know is this Charles Sturt trip down there. It's never George Maclay. No one knows who is George Maclay. But George Maclay was the only one that managed to make it back in good health. The others couldn't make it back. George had to ride into Sydney and get help for them. They made it um, up to the Darling River and he had to ride in, get help, get, them, get, get help out there and get them saved. He also collected over the years, he sent things back to London, he sent things to the Australian Museum and I'm doing searches bit by bit I find these things. He collected too when he went down to um, through Adelaide to the Coorong. I think he's probably one of the first people to ever collect uh, Major Mitchell. James, I, I call James a bird stuffer um, because we know nothing about him. Um, again, more digging needs to be done. What did he actually do? What, what particular birds? A lot of the time the birds they collected and stuffed when they first got to Australia were sent back to London and then have been lost. That makes it a bit harder. Part two. William Sharp Maclay. This is the guy who impresses me the most. Look at that high forehead. <laughs> I just look at this picture, I think this guy looks intelligent. And he was. In his day, he was the savant of the colony. He was the great evolutionary biologist. Now Darwin wrote to him, this is little quote from a letter that Darwin was introducing someone, a friend of his, who he sent out to Australia. 
And she said, you have aided me so essentially in publishing. And I was a bit surprised by that because Darwin and William Sharp were on different ideas. So when I followed it up, he's not referring to the origin of the species, he's referring to an earlier publication, The Voyage of the Beetle. So apparently, William Sharp sort of just pushed it, said, come on, come on, you've done, you've done the trip, now publish a book. Tell us about it. So he's referring to that. But he's an evolutionary biologist. During the Napoleonic Wars, or just after, and there's an anchor there, so 1815, we've got Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo. So by 1818, William Sharp, working for the War Office, connections with father, etc., is getting some uh, particularly scientist prisoners back to, back to Britain. But he also talked with these people, Latriel, Cubius, and Hare, St. Hilliard, Lamarck. Lamarck, of course, is very famous in evolutionary circles for the giraffe. Got a long neck because it reached a lot in its lifetime, therefore it passed along this character to its young. It's wrong, as we know. But between Lamarck and Darwin sat another theory, and it was held as the number one theory until Darwin replaced it, and it came from William Sharp. Sharp's theory. He wasn't just a collector, he was an active scientist. Oh, and he went to Cuba in 1825. He was appointed to try and stop the slavery there by the Spanish and British governments. He spent a lot of time there, he published, he researched, and he collected. This is a page from his most famous publication. And this shows his idea on evolution. William Sharp's biggest problem was he couldn't let go of God. God was in everything. So evolution had to be highly organized and neat and tidy. And so he found the answer here. Everything was in fives. It's the Quinarian system. And so this argument stayed until Darwin replaced it. What he did do in science that's useful was separated affinities from analogies. So when something is shared, a shared trait, he recognised this is different to something that's analogous. It's a very important breakthrough, it's down to him. He arrived in Sydney in 1839 and he found his father Alexander in pecuniary problems. Alexander was used to having money but he wasn't good at keeping it or managing it. So, the problems. The bank in Scotland failed, and it's always annoying when the bank you own fails. It always costs you a lot of money. Um, no doubt it cost him a lot. Elizabeth Bay House, lovely house, but it cost a lot to build. He'd already borrowed £18,000 from William Shaw. He was already in big trouble. He had um, dairy stations, cattle stations, sheep stations around the place. Because he was colonial secretary, he was able to give himself land and develop it. But apparently he couldn't quite manage it well. There was also a global financial crisis. Really was. This was hurting him. So the senior public servant was headed to debtor's prison. So William Sharp had to save him. These were the solutions. He took over the mortgage of Elizabeth Bay House for £12,000. Unfortunately, he also told his dad he had to get out and go and live in the house in Camden. Yeah, it was not happy. He sold the family library of 4,000 volumes. Oh my God. Bothers me, that one. And the family's furniture. That would have really bothered his father, I think. And a long lasting rift developed between father and son. He did solve the problems. He did keep him out of jail. But it came at a price that was never resolved. Alexander died in 1848. And the dynasty has moved on now to William Sharp. So William Sharp in his lifetime is added to the cabinet. He now puts his cabinet with his father's cabinet. It's all growing very nicely. In the mornings, he'll walk along the shoreline there at Elizabeth Bay, back when Sydney Harbour actually had lots of marine things that weren't extinct yet, and they still had fish in the harbour. It was a different harbour from the distant day. 
And I picture him walking along there early in the morning, sifting through what's washed up overnight. Oh, it's a wonderful time to be a biologist, especially that close to the shore in that big house. It all looks very comfortable. So, this is important. William Sharp was a diabetic and he knew he was going to die. He knew he had to do something about it. So I put this up. This is a codicil attached to his will. Very important you study it thoroughly. That's why it's all there. And notice at the bottom it's signed by William John Maclay. So I have to save you really reading it. <laughs> These are the important points. One, without subtracting from and to the University of Cambridge and the University of Sydney. So what we, William John Maclay had to agree to was to not subtract from, not take anything out of the collections if they were going to pass to him. And William John Maclay also had to agree to pass them to the University of Sydney or Cambridge on his death. Or he could pass them on in his lifetime if he wished. These are very important. Part three, William John Maclay. Now, we don't really call him William John Maclay, we call him William Maclay. He is the most famous. Now, I might have mentioned earlier to keep an eye on our bust, I should have. So, focusing more on it. This is William Maclay, later Sir William Maclay. He arrived with William Sharp. He came on the same boat with William Sharp, but he arrived as a young man of 19. He also came out with the MacArthur's. Does that name ring a bell for anyone here? MacArthur's were big into sheep and later big into botany or horticulture. Um, he got a lot of information from the MacArthur's and he also would have been lectured to by William Sharp about the beauty of biology. And both of these things are obvious. He made a lot of money as a squatter. He was very good as a businessman with his sheep. He's also a politician, seems to run into family. 18 years, seven terms. And after William Sharp died, he moved into Elizabeth Bay House. This is a picture of William as an older man. From 1861, he was a trustee of the Australian Museum. And the same year, he sent George Masters, a very important figure in, in, in biology at that time, to tropical Queensland. He sent Damel to to Fiji to collect. He immediately realised what we needed to do was to collect locally. Not just around Sydney, but locally in Australia and in the Pacific. The McLean Museum now has great collections from these areas and New Guinea. <coughs> he started the Entomological Society in 1862. Didn't work out very well, just lasted a few years, published transactions for a couple of years. They moved on to calling it the Linnaean Society of New South Wales. It became the big scientific meeting point in Australia. He was buying specimens madly. He bought, or he, he rented um, a steamer to go up and down the coast, dredging, collecting. He really had ideas about building up the collection, and he did. Uh, founder and benefactor of the Linnaean Society of New South Wales. They put this picture up on their website. They don't forget that they could have dissolved so many times every time he came to the rescue. In itself, a very big story, his association just with that society. And in 1875, the book I, I finished, not published yet, is exactly on this, the first scientific expedition to leave Australia for a foreign shore. It was a bold step, because Australia were now looking overseas, not just within. Very few countries have been mature enough to explore around the world. Australia now stepped into that, thanks to William Maclean. And it was the beginning of an amazing expedition. But that's where I leave the story for today, because of the time. There's not enough time to tell the story in one go. Where'd they go? Where'd they go? They, yeah. went, to, they went to Queensland. <laughs> I, I believe it's Queensland a foreign ship. Well, I'm going to rebuild on that. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, I say that on purpose. Um, they went to New Guinea and Torres Straits and Queensland through the reef, through islands, not the mainland. So the foreign shore was, was principally New Guinea, but arguably Torres Strait as well. Um, and they collected very, very successfully. Very successfully. But that's another story. Well, let me come back to 1893 here. Why was it adjectival betrayal? Now, ideally, I would like to go on and tell you the whole Shepherd expedition and then the history that follows that. There's not enough time. Shortly after William Maclay died, Sydney University took the building, took all the collections, put them into storage or gave them away, and took the building for teaching and office space. The building had been donated by the government. The government paid for it, not the university. The codicil of the will, you could see, none of this should have happened, but it did. Lots of the collection have been lost. Lots have been traded to other people. Well, it's been given out on what's called long-term loans, which frustrates me. What is a long-term loan? Particularly all the most valuable stuff. And work I've done on the type specimens of birds that were shifted from the McLean Museum to the Australian Museum, some have been lost. The Australian Museum lost them. It's really frustrating. But that's the adjectival betrayal. He gave it to the university, they accepted it, and just after he died, they turned it into office space. And when I worked in that building, still doing the same thing, still fighting each other for office space. Does that happen here? Someone at the Powerhouse Museum, the last place I wrote to, people who have the, his 
diary, they went, oh, this is lithofracta. Mm -hmm. It's simple. Okay, but most importantly of the whole morning, which Maclay is Maclay's honey eater name? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, probably William John. I'm just trying to remember the type specimen. That's part three of the second one. Yeah. yeah. Um, you've got to be careful sometimes. There's one named after his wife. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just a bit worried that it might be that McCoy honey eater named after Susanna. It's uh, like Gould Infinity, isn't it? Well, well Gould Infinity is obviously named after Gould. No, it's a Latin name. This is after his wife, isn't it? I think that's right, isn't it? I don't know the Latin, I can't remember. Yeah. Gilbert never had Gilbert's, he got Gilbert's whistle of the common name, but it's named Gilbert Eye in, in the bird. Which, you know, most of these names, you know, the shooting, it's really sad. Okay, very clear. When we just did the trail, um, well, with the Sydney University, um, they acted illegally because it was going against um, his will, wasn't it? Uh, was there any, would it? Um, I don't know if they acted illegally. It looks to me like they did, but I'm not a lawyer. The lawyers will have to argue that one, and it'll cost a lot of money to get lawyers out of bed, and I don't have it. So, <laughs> so and it's difficult because it's so old. Um, I, I think it was probably illegal, but they did it. At the time, Joseph James Fletcher, who was secretary of the Land Society, he spoke up very strongly. This is in the 1920s, he's speaking. <laughs> about the damage when he found the damage to the specimens. Um, but the university wouldn't buy They wouldn't give him. Is there any inventory of, like an original inventory of what was in the cabinet before it was all broken up or has that been pretty much lost? Not that the McLean Museum will show me. If there was, there's, there's, there's some early collection books from William John McLean. Uh, nothing, that I, might be something on the insects from Alexander, but nothing on Alexander's birds. Anything there I have to work out for myself. That's been really hard and very little I can find out. He definitely, obviously I will know that he had this bird when someone publishes that they thank him for letting them see it. And that was in London, so I knew it was collected and he had it in his, his collection way then. I've never seen anything. Oh man, William Sharp the same. Uh, again, if they publish, like William Sharp published them on decapods. So, I mean, get an idea what he saw, who it was from, and whether it was his or not. So, a lot of digging to find out these answers. So, in 200 years' time, when we're not writing any letters or anything, like, what are the historians going to be using? Sorry? So, in 200 years' time, 200 years time. When, when they're trying to figure out what we've done, like, are they going to be sifting through emails, or are they just going to be using Twitter? Oh, <laughs> yeah. I, I think or like the scientific journals, because uh, there's no records of. Oh, they'll probably be sifting through radioactive ashes. Won't they? <laughs> 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 Closing it down to move to move it 
to where the tennis courts are at the University of Sydney. And they're going to have a new building there. Someone from Hong Kong donated a lot of money to build a new building. They're not getting the right building, which is theirs. They're not getting that. The university will never give it back to them. Um, so at the moment, it's temporarily closed, the intention to move it to a, a, new, a new place. I suspect it will be in storage and not really in the new building mm. because the tennis courts aren't that big at the University of Sydney. The old museum is much bigger. The tennis courts would be more in front of that downhill bit. Sure, they didn't want the museum to go just to Alexander. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think they were totally gobsmacked by it. Right. Oh my yeah. God, you're not taking it with you. Right. Yeah. yeah, I think yeah, that really surprised them. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know all the movements behind the scenes that were kicking him out of England. Yeah. Obviously, he wasn't happy with it. He probably stepped on someone's toes. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not interested. I want to know what happened to the birds. <laughs> <laughs> and he must have been a visionary, which is probably the reason why he took the museum with him, because he was sort of envisioning how this is going to become a great continent. Again, I don't know. He was certainly rich enough and interested enough. Visionary, I don't know. 